All right, I think I'm going to just get started um, with our intro and as more people join, uh, they can get caught up of and um, the session is recorded so if people miss anything they can go back to it as well. So thank you so much for joining our discussion today on disability a subject that is very close to my heart. Um, I'm Cynthia Bauer and I am the founder and executive director of Cupenda for the children serving children with disabilities in Africa. Uh, Leonard is my co founder and one of our panelists you'll see later. Uh, but if you're new to Christian Connections for International Health, it is an international network of approximately 115 Christian organizations and 15 secular partners, as well as a few hundred individual members. And CCIH's mission is to promote health and wholeness from a Christian perspective and provides opportunities for capacity building, networking, sharing, best practices, and advocacy. And today we're going to hear from a panel of experts responding to questions about myths and misconceptions some faith communities attribute to disability. We'll also share some important resources for including disability in community development work. This webinar is co-sponsored by Christian Connections for International Health, um, Health Community-Based Prevention and Care Working Group, uh, Cure International, and Cupenda for the Children. And so today, we're, the flow of this webinar is going to be like this. Uh, we're going to hear a brief intro from our first speaker and ask our panel to respond to a few key questions. And then we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. So if you could, please use the Q&A box on Zoom to type in your questions. And we'll answer as many as we can as we go along. Um, the webinar is being recorded, like I said before, and will be posted on the CCIH YouTube channel and on the CCIH website under events and webinar recordings. You'll also get an email with a link to the recording once it's posted. So like I said before, my name is Cynthia Bauer, Executive Director and Co-Founder of Cupenda for the Children. You can see all of my bio there. I won't go into too many details. I myself um, am a person with a disability. I'm missing my left arm. The reason that I started Cupenda 20 something years ago is I was told I might have been killed if I had been born on the coast of Kenya uh, because of stigma, because of a lack of understanding of people's capabilities. And Leonard, who is on our panel today, uh, is someone that you'll hear more from later. Uh, we met 20 years ago and started this work and we realized how important stigma is to a disability. But the first person you're gonna hear from is Abdul Bakani, who's a PhD from working at John Hopkins University. And he's going to tell us a little more about the current status of disability and response in low and middle, middle income countries, touching on some of the current projects that he's working now. So if you want to go ahead and start up, Abdul, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Cynthia, and um, really great to be here um, for this webinar. Um, it's a really um, an important topic that we're addressing and one that's uh, close to my heart as well, as it has been the focus of uh, much of my um, professional work in the field of public health. Just uh, by way of brief introduction, I'm uh, Abdul Bujani. I am originally from Kenya. I was born and raised in Mombasa, Kenya and then came over um, to the United States to pursue higher education. And I'm currently at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, serving as an associate professor in international health and director for the Johns Hopkins International Injury Research Unit. Next. So um, what I'm gonna do today is um, provide a brief introduction on um, disability and um, the response to disability in low and middle income countries. Um, and also spotlight uh, one of the more recent projects that we've started that focuses on rehabilitation. Next. So this is how we will divide up the next 10 minutes or so, um, why it's important to consider, to consider disability as we're thinking about public health, um, more specifically, the current status of disability and uh, issues related to that. And we will go into some conceptualization of disability and some history behind it, because it's important to understand as we're trying to address issues specifically of um, stigma and access to services for people with disability in low and middle income countries. 
and then um, bridge this um, gap between disability and rehabilitation and how we're now thinking more broadly about rehabilitation and applying a systems-based approach to improving rehabilitation services in low and middle income countries. Next. So when it comes to disability, um, many of us in attendance um, are likely aware of the huge burden of disability, um, but I just wanted to highlight it here as well. So globally, um, one in seven people live with some form of disability, whether it's short-term disability, long-term disability, temporary or permanent disability or relapsing. Um, different kinds of disability present themselves in different ways. Um, and that's really due to multiple things. Um, it's not that, you know, this part or this, um, component of the health burden that's attributed to disability itself has been increasing, um, although that has been the case. Um, but we've been getting a little better at measuring disability, understanding the burden of disability, but also health systems have been improving um, in terms of addressing communicable diseases. Uh, people have been living longer, treatment having, uh, have improved um, around the world. And so we're seeing a change in disease patterns um, we're seeing more prominence for of uh, non-communicable diseases, chronic conditions. So people are living with consequences of disease much longer and um, that comes with um, some morbidity. And now with COVID-19 as well, and we think if we think about disability more broadly um, as anything that's less than perfect health, um, people will be living with consequences of uh, COVID-19 as well. And it's important for us to think about it and be part of that conversation, especially as we're um, trying to um, address issues related to disability, access to health services and other services as well. Um, disability impacts not just the individual, um, but as we know, and especially as is the case in uh, low and middle income countries, families are affected um, and the impacts go much beyond the families as well. And society is impacted um, people without access to appropriate services aren't able to contribute as to their potential. Um, there's caregiving needs and other other needs that are emerging in the society as well. And so when we think about the consequences really of disability, uh, we have uh, we can divide them into the health, societal and economic consequences. With respect to health, there's obviously uh, physical limitations, there's needs for rehabilitation, um, there's chronic conditions that need conditions that need um, regular follow-up and um, treatment and management protocols to be in place. But these can also lead to other complications if not addressed. So people with disability can be prone to further injuries and um, be at risk for other sorts of injuries. Um, just uh, one of the other um, focus of my uh, public health work is on road traffic injuries, for example, and people with disabilities can be in, in, at an increased risk for road traffic injuries, especially with the way our roads are designed and um, our transport systems that um, often are focused around uh, moving vehicles rather than people um, can pose a big issue. With respect to societal consequences, um, there's caregiving needs that emerge and uh, most more often than not, families are um, bear the burden of that caregiving. And in the case of elderly uh, parents, for example, who are disabled, children often stay away from school and other activities um, to care for, for their parents. Stigma is a big issue and we're gonna pick up on that a little bit uh, more and related to that marginalization, there's limited educational opportunities, um, uh, poor living standards for people with disability, exposure to violence and other, other um, health risks as well. Um, with respect to economic consequences, um, you know, uh, this exposure to economic shocks, um, asset ownership is affected, health expenditures are higher for individuals with disability and multi-dimensional poverty is an issue as well. And many of these consequences we already know about. So I'm really glad uh, that this uh, webinar is focusing on um, stigma and related issues of marginalization and how we can um, really address those and uh, come on ahead. Next. Um, 
More recently, um, there has been more global attention um, to this issue of disability and disability is captured in multiple different frameworks globally. There's the UN Convention on the Rights for Persons with Disabilities um, as part of the universal health coverage agenda and a more uh, centrally located in the sustainable development goals, you will see that without addressing disability, it's very hard to be able to address inclusive education. Without addressing this issue of disability, it's gonna be difficult to achieve this goal of inclusive employment opportunities or um, social, economic, and political inclusion. That's goal 10 of the sustainable development goals. Accessible cities, transport services, and public spaces will also be hard to achieve if we're not um, addressing disability and the needs of people with disabilities living in our society. Um, and uh, directly related also is high quality, reliable, and timely available availability of disability data, which is key to being able to understand what the situation is, understand how well we're doing to address the situation, and look at trends over time um, and adjust our approaches as needed. So without reliable and timely data, um, much of this will not be able to be achieved. Next. So when we're thinking about um, the current status of disability and issues, um, it's important to take some um, what of a historical perspective and um, estimates, as I mentioned a little bit before, for disability have been histor historically problematic due to a variety of reasons. Um, and one of them is conceptualization. What a society defines as an individual with disability often reflects uh, the current sociocultural thinking around um, these issues of health and disability. And um, in, the, in the literature and in the disability field, also we have gone uh, from conceptualizing disability as a purely medical phenomenon, um, emerging as uh, looking at it um, as impairments to there was a time when we looked at it from a social lens to our current um, conceptualization of disability that looks at it as an interaction of um, health, environmental, social, and cultural factors um, in the presence of a health condition. Um, further complicating our ability um, to get reliable estimates for disability is this issue of social stigma associated with disability. And that has led to the, some difficulty in identifying um, individuals with disability. Uh, many societies um, tend to look down upon individuals with disability. Um, some look at some cultures look at it as a curse, etc. And therefore, families and societies tend to hide um, people with disabilities, especially folks with uh, mental health issues. Unfortunately, in many low and middle income countries, um, are sometimes locked away by their own families and don't get access or are, are you know, um, relevant programs, authorities, and um, people don't get to know about them to be able to um, adequately assist them or uh, help them with their needs. Um, disability has traditionally been measured through one or two questions in national censuses or cross-sectional studies that have been designed to meet specific needs. And therefore, measures have historically lacked comparability. Um, and for many low and middle income countries, these measures are simply unavailable. But more recently, there have been efforts to standardize measurements. There have been efforts to the Washington Group on Disability Statistics, for example, that developed um, a short set of questions um, that can be used for screening. Those questions are increasingly being adopted in national um, surveys and national censuses, et cetera. And therefore there has been work and continues to be work in terms of getting more reliable estimates um, for this prevalence of disability, but also what kinds and types of disabilities exist so that we can be better able to meet um, the needs of the population. Next. So I just wanted to briefly go over this conceptualization. Um, so I mentioned that we went from a medical model that um, used pathology as a starting point, which leads to impairment, functional limitation, and disability. While this model did present itself as a linear model, the text that went along with the model did, um, to its credit, 
identify the social components of disability and the complex interactions. But um, there was a lot of uh, pushback and um, rightfully so because of this depiction of a, of a linear pathway from pathology to disability. And through multiple iterations, we um, now use the International Classification for Functioning Disability in Health, the ICF model, um, that looks at disability as a complex interaction between uh, body functions, activity limitations, and participation in society um, due to health condition. And that's um, closely impacted um, through interactions with the environment as well as personal factors at the individual level. So this um, is our current conceptualization of disability and the way um, and the ICF framework does provide a framework to uh, measure different components and look at um, how each of these um, different pieces are interacting with each other to be able to get a more holistic understanding of disability to be able to see how, for example, environmental factors are contributing to activity limitations and how we can address those um, and make them more context specific. Next. So um, Abdul, we're starting to run low on time. So sure. give me a minute or so more before we get to our panelists. Thanks so much. And so efforts, um, as I mentioned, have focused around um, improving um, our understanding of the burden of disability. That's the Disability Data Initiative. And I will not go into detail, but um, essentially there's been uh, a lot of effort that goes into trying to standardize measurement of disability and um, expand our measurement to many different settings so that we can get better information and data um, to be able to address needs. Next. Um, another response has been a focus on inclusive health systems. Um, again, building on this um, universal health coverage framework and the sustainable development goals agenda. We know that health systems currently are not designed to be inclusive uh, for people with disability, especially in low and middle income countries. And um, some of the barriers um, that I've listed here, physical access uh, remain an issue, attitudinal barriers, financial barriers, training of health workers to better uh, address, understand and address needs for individuals with disability that can be different from the general population. Equipment related barriers, so much of the equipment used is not designed to be accommodative of individuals' disability as well as social cultural barriers. And there are some efforts to underway to address um, some of these issues. One of these efforts, next slide please, um, is a program that I'm leading that's funded by um, the USAID, that's the Learning, Acting and Building for Rehabilitation and Health Systems. Here we take an expansive view of rehabilitation and want to um, really emphasize that rehabilitation can benefit not only people with disabilities, but the general population as well. Next slide. And Abdul, I think for, for time's sake, uh, we'll give a link to people uh, so they can see more details of this because we need to get to the next panelist. And I think that some of this is also going to be addressed and we'd love for you to chime in on these as well. If that's okay. That's Thank great. you so much, Abdul. I really appreciate um, all your sharing. I think disability is an issue that I wish we had all day to talk about this and to listen to your expertise. Um, but we got to get to the next panelist, if that's okay. Um, so I wanted to introduce to you... Um, um, Ernest Kiyoko, and Ernest Kiyoko um, works as Cure International Se Senior Director of Spiritual Ministry. Um, he's also in the process of getting his PhD in theology, which is a really important um, aspect of this kind of work, and you can read more about him. Um, and we have a partnership as Kupenda with Cure International as well. And we also have Leonard and Bonani that's going to be on this, is on this panel today. Um, Leonard can tell you where he's actually coming to you from today um, to sh tell you how, how committed he is to this work. He's actually my co-founder. Uh, he's our Kenya director um, for our organization called Kuhenza. And he, his background is in special needs education as well as uh, disability research. And so today, and I wanted to actually start out by asking a couple questions. I think I wanna make sure these guys have their um, cameras turned on. Leonard, or, is Leonard there? And if Leonard's not there, uh, 
he's he's literally i'll just tell you where he is he's literally coming to you from the hospital where he's having chemotherapy treatments at this time that's how committed he is to this work and so as we ask these questions i think just to change it up on the fly if leonard is not here i can't really tell um leonard if you're there can you turn your camera on um, maybe um, Kathy or Carolyn, in the meantime, you could try to get a hold of Leonard while we keep going. Um, I can answer some of Leonard's questions and maybe Abdul, if you wanted to chime in too. But Ernest, can I start with you? Um, oh, there he is, there's Leonard. Um, Leonard, I, I, Ernest, I'd love to hear from you how you define disability in your communities. Because we've learned just as Abdul just talked about is the definition is actually not always clear. And as we talk about this subject, it's important to understand what is, what is the definition in your communities? How is it defined, disability? Thank you, Cynthia, for the invitation. And uh, I'm glad to make a contribution today based on today's discussion. Based on my 17 years in the hospital and interacting with different communities in Kenya, I should concur with Abdul that there is no specific definition. Even when you look at the communities uh, where we come from, there is no one definition. That is something that is clear. Based on my community, and I think this cuts across a significant number of communities in our country, the definition of disability is based on several things. One is based on the location of the disability. If it is somebody who can't see, it is defined by somebody who can see. If it is somebody who cannot walk, then the definition is based on that challenge of walking. So that is one. The second thing, of course, the definition is based on the limitation it brings to the person. So when you are referring to somebody who can't walk, mostly people define it based on, call that person who can't walk well. You know? So it's again based on the limitation. And the third thing that uh, definition of the disability come along is based on the social orientation of the community. There are communities that are highly entrenched on traditions. Others are highly entrenched on Christian belief. So depending on what is highly influencing your worldview, then that is how the definition is formed. So in short, there is no specific definition, even in my community. It's all about where the disability is, the limitation the disability causes, or even one's worldview. Thanks, Ernest. Leonard, did you have anything to add to Ernest's definition of disability? While I wait for Leonard to unmute, um, I really appreciate what you said, Ernest, about um, societal perception, because one of the things we often focus on in our work is that disability is based on what society views you on often, especially in low and middle income countries. Uh, for example, I was born without my left hand, and because people think I can't do things, I'm therefore disabled, even though all I really can't do is do a handstand, but because society views me as disabled, I become disabled. Um, Leonard, are you able to unmute? Sorry, I know he's trying to do multiple things at the same time. Um, I, I think that Leonard would actually also reiterate that part that it's really like societal viewpoints and perceptions are usually bigger barriers. And the definition we often use in our work is the national definition in the Disability Act, as well as the UN's dis, uh, definition. But let's go on to the next question. Um, Leonard, are you able to unmute? I'm not, some technical, technical difficulties. Um, the next question I have for, for you, Ernest, and honestly, because Leonard it seems to be having some trouble, um, if Abdul wanted to chime in too, uh, but Ernest, what is the dominant belief system or theological misconceptions in the churches and communities regarding the causes and interventions for disability? Thank you once again. Um, just before I jump into that question, allow me to add this, that uh, the perception, the definition, most of the times is given by the abled people. This is something I've realized in the ministry, that the people who are able are the ones who are defining who is disabled. And I saw this recently in Zambia and Zimbabwe, where the people who are able are kind of putting words like limited, restricted, incompetent. 
yet we don't even ask the people who are disabled themselves, whether they are limited or even they are incompetent. So that is a big challenge when it comes to the definition. But once, uh, having said that, I want to say again, the causes and the pursuit for healing of disability, especially speaking from an African perspective, is defined by three things, three worlds, if I can say. There is the modern world where we find ourselves and the modern world tends to bring the medical definition in terms of the causes of disability, where we talk about impairment or something like that. And so the healing will follow a medical definition where it has to talk about, you need to get a surgery, something like that. But then there is the African worldview, which is more of the African tradition. This one is defined from a social perspective. The cause of disability is defined from a social level, meaning if you have been born with disability, then the perception is the cause is you have an issue with the ancestors. Maybe you have an issue with the living dead. So it's all about... Uh, the social worldview from the African perspective. And so the healing will follow the same worldview. By this, I mean, somebody will believe the healing has to do with, you have to settle issues with your ancestors, with the living dead or with the other people. And lastly, if you are really entrenched in the Christian worldview, again in Africa, then you look at the cause from that perspective. This could be something to do with people believe it's punishment from God. And therefore, how do you get the healing? You need to settle it with God. This is where we talk about delivering people from demons and something like that. So again, the misconception is highly based on what influences one. And Leonard, now that we have you back on, uh, could you add to... Uh, what is the dominant belief system in the communities we work with regarding the causes and interventions of disability? Uh, thank you so much. The belief system in our community. First and foremost, it is the community which came up with the belief system and misperception about the disability, whereby most of them do believe in witchcraft, believe in demons, Others believe in incest. Others believe in curses. This is the most uh, cause of disability that uh, our community believes in. And how does that end up, um, what does that end up looking like in the community in which you work? Uh, yes. In the community we work, we work with, this means there is a lot of uh, resistance because people have been made to believe in these things for many, many years. So as much as you bring uh, the idea that these are not the true causes of disability, but still you find that you are meeting a lot of resistance. However, that doesn't mean we should be totally unable to move. Because again, they are the people who made the misconceptions and they are the same people we are using to undo what they have been believing in for many, many years. So could you, either one of you maybe give an example of what this might look like for a person with a disability living in the communities in which you work? Ernest? Well, let, oh, sorry, yes. sorry, Leonard, Leonard and then Ernest, yeah. Yes. Uh, from my experience with the people I have interacted who are living with disabilities, indeed, they are going through a lot of challenges. And I want to share a very personal example. I was born in an extended family where I had an aunt who had been born with a hearing impairment, but her life was all the time a struggle. She was struggling to be understood by the rest of the family members, but none of them would understand this person. So sometimes she felt so frustrated, uh, trying to communicate, trying to make people understand, but never was she understood. And she lived a life of isolation, a life of feeling like she has nobody to connect to, and that was her life all through. Uh, and maybe, Ernest, can you expand on that? Yeah, yeah thank you, Leon uh, Leonard. I am in agreement with him that... Uh, in most cases, these people are not understood. They are highly frustrated. 
And as I said earlier, it's because we have not gotten into their world to understand what they think and what they are doing. Having said that, uh, it is evident, most of the times the society we are in will measure a lot of emphasis on power and beauty or even wealthy, which is contrary to most of the people with disability. If you are not beautiful based on your face, your legs and all that, then the community tends to segregate. If you don't have the power to fight for yourself, then nobody is there to listen to you. And therefore, these people live a life of frustration. Sometimes they feel the burden of stigma and at some point is like they are an expense while in the midst of the rest of the community. So bottom line is not a very positive kind of a living unless somebody has to rise and embrace them. And and in this particular regard, I think that what you were just mentioning, Ernest, is what we often call the prosperity gospel or the health and wealth gospel, right? Um, and as we're talking about that, how does that relate to people's view on healing and disability? Um, the idea being what, if, good, if you're good, then good things happen to you. How prevalent is that idea in your communities? Thank you. Uh, and I think this would cut across in many communities. Again, it's all about who looks good, who wants good. And so most of the times when it comes to the preachers of prosperity gospel, they will talk about the highly things that people need to have. And if somebody with a disability walks into their child, of course the emphasis will be, you need to receive a miracle. But in the unlikely way this healing does it, mostly they are related to do with your faith is not enough. That's why you are in the situation you are in. That's why healing is not coming your way. But again, um, the society will still find itself going around to give excuses why they can't reach out to these people. And so healing is always associated with the strong, with those strength faith. And so if you are not strong physically, if you don't have strong faith, then that is why people look at it as if you are not able and worthy to receive before I go to the next question, Leonard, can you expand on that at all? Is there anything else you'd like to add? Maybe an example of a it. person that you know in your community that's had this kind of negative experience regarding faith, which is most of the people we work with, I know. So Leonard, go ahead. Yes, hi. Uh, Ernest is very, very right. Because this is exactly what the community, particularly the pastors believe in. And I have an experience of a child who went to the church with a hope that uh, she was going to be healed uh, through prayers. But as much as the preacher tried to do the healing prayers, this is, did not happen. However, they, did, they ended up blaming the, pa the child and the parents for the child not getting healing because they were not believers. Their faith was very little. And also maybe even their parents I did not have enough faith. So in the long run, this child and the parent were told that you cannot uh, be in our church. If I told you, can, you don't have that very strong belief. You don't uh, believe that through prayers, your child can be cured. So it's something which is very common. It's affecting so many uh, families of children with disabilities. On top of that, they are already suffering as a result of the disability. But again, here is the pastor blaming them for not having good faith or strong faith. That's why their children are not getting healed of their disability. Thanks. And I appreciate a question I saw in the chat that's asking how we can do that, uh, what we can do about this. And that's going to be the last question I'm going to be asking that you guys are going to address. But going on to the next and kind of connected to what we were just saying, do you think that most uh, oftentimes when children with disabilities are in need of actual medical intervention, are they doing healing prayers instead of go seeking medical access? Uh, let me go first once again. Um, again, out of experience, it depends with the strong uh, um, orientation of the community and the parents. What do I mean by this? If the parents are more inclined to the faith model of healing, more likely they will pursue a pastor for healing as the beginning point until the point where they will realize it is not one. 
if they are more up to date with the technology, what I call the modern world, they will be more leaning towards the medical intervention. If again, they are more leaning towards the African traditional worldview, most likely they will pursue the witch doctors, all those people can sort it traditionally. So that is something that I would say it cuts across. It's an issue of how much inclination do you have between the three worlds, the modern world, the medical worldview, the faith kind of a model of healing or the African traditional way of healing. But having said that, it's important to emphasize that most of the times these people crisscross the three worlds. At one point, they will try the medical. If it doesn't work, they will give up. They will go to the pastor. At the next moment, if it doesn't work with the pastor, they will go to the African traditional doctor. And one thing that comes out is there is a lot of wastage and mismanagement. Wastage of time. Most of the times it has to do with paying money, transport, and all that. So in short, all of this kind of back and forth pursuit of healing has never been a one straightforward. And that's why many people find themselves Struggling. And I think that is why the right question we have, what can we do to ensure we provide a clear pathway for you? Yeah. Leonard, would you like to expand on that? Are there any other um, challenges that exist? For, what are some of the perceptions and challenges that exist for people with disabilities accessing proper health care? Knowing that not every disability requires a specialized health care, but you know, as individuals, regardless of our ability, we all need access to healthcare. So what are some of the challenges that exist for people with disability regarding access to healthcare? Okay, first and foremost, I want to say it all depends on uh, the community, how far it is from the hospital, for instance, you'll find that those who are very near the hospital will have a tendency of taking their children to the hospital for treatment. But for those who are in the far end, that is in the rural, the first person they are going to meet will be always uh, the herbalist because he's very near. So they will seek assistance from the herbalist. Indeed, we have seen the side effects. However, you will also find that school or hospitals are very far from where most of these people are living. For example, if it's a child who needs therapy, he should at least go twice in a week for therapy services. And maybe he's coming 50 kilometers away. He needs the fare. Maybe the child is in a wheelchair. You can imagine they are going to charge even the wheelchair, which becomes quite difficult for these uh, parents to access health services. But again, when you go to the hospitals again, you find there are also challenges. One, you find that uh, maybe uh, this is a child who has hearing impairment. Getting to the hospital, nobody can do the interpretation. Sometimes even these people get to the hospital, maybe it's in a wheelchair, you find that the environment is not barrier free. So there are quite a number of challenges that are making health not uh, accessible to persons with the disabilities. Thanks for that. And Leonard, while um, you're speaking, I would like to go on to the last question. People are itching to hear this. Um, and I'd love to start with you on this, obviously, because it's 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 the work that you and I have been doing forever, which is what, what are you doing to improve inclusion of people with disabilities? First, to address the stigma and working with the faith leaders to address these misconceptions and superstitions around disability. What are, what are we doing? Thank you so much, Cindy. As I've earlier said, the community or the pastors or the church believers are part of the communities. And in the community, you will find that they are responsible of having built all these beliefs and misperceptions. So one, what we have started as an organization to address these issues is one to involve the same people who built these beliefs and perceptions to be able to undo them. Starting with pastors, traditional healers, and even government leaders. And what we have do, done is to bring them to a workshop, train them on the real causes, and how to include people with disabilities in the society. And we have seen the positive of effect, the positive side of it, because as they leave, you will find that they go to search for these children 
do counseling, refer them for medication, and also refer them for education. And this is being done by the pastors, the traditional healers, and even the government. But above all, we also have issues of policy. Remember policies, if are not good for people with disabilities, then we are not doing much. So what we have done is to engage the policy makers in making sure that the policies they have made are being implemented and other new policies to support people with disabilities are put in place. Then there's the government leaders whom we have trained during our workshops to make sure they reinforce all these policies that ha have been made to support people with disabilities. Again, we have seen that even in educating children with disabilities through child sponsorship is also a way of empowering these children and it is reducing the stigma because if they see these children being able to do something as a result of education, that reduces the, the stigma and also makes these children to be included in the society. The same with the medication, we do support them. If they are rehabilitated, for sure, their stigma will reduce because this person is able to support himself or even the disability is not as severe as it was before. And again, we have also put the parents into parent support groups so that they can share the experiences, they can help one another, and even start small income generating projects to be able to support each other. And to go back a little bit more, Leonard, could you expand a little bit more, especially regarding pastors and how you address the issues we talked about regarding faith and the prosperity gospel? How are those two things addressed in our workshops? And then I'll go on to Ernest after. Could you expand on that, Leonard? Thank you so much. Okay, we have not been imposing all this information to the pastors. First, we use the pastors themselves to build a training guide. And it's like we were asking them, what does the Bible say about people with disabilities? And they went to the Bible, uh, did some research, and found out what the Bible says. And they realized that they have a lot of responsibilities as pastors in relation to persons with disabilities. So it's like we are reminding them using the Bible. So during the, the training, you find that we are looking at the causes of, of disability. We are also looking at faith, uh, uh, faith healing and the responsibility of the church as far as persons with disabilities are concerned. And indeed, at the end, you will find that quite a number may have come to the, church, to the workshop believing that the demons and the cars are the causes of disability. But through the teaching and the discussion, you find that at the end, and we do this through a survey. The, before they start, we do a survey about what they know about disability. And at the end of the training, we do another survey. But when you compare the results, you find that quite a number of the pastors have now changed from the traditional beliefs, and they now believe that, yes, it's more of medical uh, causes. Yeah, and we address things like, are there people in the Bible with disabilities, which there are, that weren't healed, and we talk about different kinds of healing, not just a cure, as many people talk about, but healing, meaning removing stigma and becoming part of a community is a healing in and of itself. Ernest, do you want to add anything to that in terms of how you're addressing these issues? Thank you. Um, just as Leonard has mentioned, cure is equally doing similar initiatives. And I know there is a question that has been asked of what is happening. And I can say a lot is happening in different organizations. And so speaking specifically for cure, we have a training we call theology of disability. And this training is primarily geared towards bringing the biblical understanding of disability. Of course, we build it based on the general causes, the medical reasons of disability, the general views in the community, which are, when you talk about the community views are more negative, but then the theology of disability training, we are trying to bring the aspect of God in the story of disability, the whole aspect of body, soul, and the spirit. And this training is geared towards the church leaders, but also the community leaders. 
the whole idea is to bring the opinion leaders in the community to understand disability as God looks at it, but equally, as Leonard mentioned, to respond the way God would have wanted to respond. What we are doing in CURE equally, we are looking at it from an integrated point of view, where we are healing, treating the disability through the hospitals, but also championing the faith church so that people can see what the medical can do, but also people can see what can God do through the proper understanding, medically, spiritually, and all that. So CURE is taking similar initiatives as Kupenda, and at the end of the day, all what we are doing is to make sure we train the pastors, the opinion leaders in the society, who not only get it theoretically, but we also incorporate them in the process in which way they go ahead and create awareness in the community. They go ahead and ensure that we have the right facilities, churches everywhere that are disability friendly. The, the idea is to challenge the leaders to do what they can to make people with disability to be inclusive and participating in the community. And lastly, of course, with the healing that we realize from the hospitals, these patients become a testimony of what God can do. And therefore they become a bus and us in the communities where they come from and also through the platforms where Cure shares their work. And I think that way we are trying to clear the myth and demonstrate what it means that with a disability, you can still be a person used by God, potential for his use. Am I correct, Ernest, that um, some of the materials from Cure you've used, you've incorporated the materials from Kupenda, is that correct? Yes, yes, we, we have incorporated several from you guys and it, we really appreciate. So it is more of a partnership that is happening. And I think this goes a broad way just to show what it means when we are approaching the issue of disability. It's not a one-man show, it's a combined effort. Yeah, and so from, from your perspectives, both Ernest and Leonard, how can others, like those people here um, on this webinar, how can they actually improve inclusion of people with disabilities, especially in faith communities and in healthcare system? Um, what can we do? I know that one of the things that we have is we have a workshop model we're willing to share with others. Um, ours is a one day uh, with pastors and other Christian leaders. And we also work with NGOs to do trainings to address these issues. Because I think people might be surprised at even um, in large scale development organizations, that some of these theologies exist in their leadership in development organizations once you start asking the right questions. Um, so Leonard and Ernest, what, what can some of the people here do to improve inclusion of people with disabilities in their communities and healthcare systems? Uh, thank you, Cindy. I think uh, we have started on how to include people with disabilities. But we are a small number, and I think, as you have said it rightly, many people should come here. Who are these? These are the churches, these are the NGOs, and even government leaders. They need to plan in a way that whatever they do, they have a component of inclusion in whatever they do in their daily businesses. Because addressing disability is cutting across. It's not a one-man show, as Ernest has said. So I'm asking, it is possible if all leaders, right from the local, can include or can uh, make sure that whatever they do, they include the person to the disability. That way, we shall be a big number of people addressing the issue of inclusion. Or else, if it is left to few people, then we may not be able to address it fully. Yeah, thank you so much. And I would love to bring Abdul back into the conversation as we've got about 10 minutes, a little less than 10 minutes left. Is there any other questions? I just saw the one question in the chat about basically what we're doing to do this kind of thing. So we could go into more detail about it if people are interested. Um, feel free to reach out to Ernest or Leonard or myself or Abdul uh, for more tools and resources or longer conversations. Uh, but if there's any more questions, please in the Q&A. But Abdul, I'd love to give you an opportunity to answer especially the question about how can we be more inclusive when it comes to working with faith leaders around the issue of disability? 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that question, and thanks for this uh, rich discussion we've had. Um, thanks, Ernest and Leonard, uh, for your insights and all the work that you're doing. I think uh, a couple of things that um, I've heard that I wanted to react to is um, this issue around healing. And I think, Cynthia, you touched on it as well. Um, healing, um, if we take a more expansive view of healing and we think about people with disability, we're not necessarily trying to look at people as having a defect that we need to resolve and treat. Right? Um, and that's what um, our conceptualization of disability has moved towards is what we're really aiming to do here is enable people with certain activity limitations to be functioning and participating members of the society. And that may not necessarily involve resolving whatever impairment they have. So thinking about and talking about healing in, in, in those terms as enabling people to be able to function um, as um, equal members of the society is where we need to go. And that's where assistive technologies come in. That's where um, some of these opportunities that Leonard and Ernest talked about, income generating opportunities. Um, come in as well and these inclusive programs. Uh, many countries do have um, good policies in the books, but um, it's about implementation of those policies. If all those policies were implemented, then we really wouldn't be seeing some of the physical barriers to access to health clinics and health services. Um, and so really trying to focus in on having um, the right implementation mechanisms in place for these policies would be another uh, aspect to focus on. Um, one other thing that um, I heard, I think Leonard was mentioning that um, with people, some people needing follow-up care that live really far away and trying to really embed some of these services into community-based health systems. There's community health worker models, there's um, village health teams in many countries, low and middle income countries that can be used to um, provide some of these services, to provide some of these follow-ups with adequate um, tools in place. So one of the things that we're working on, for example, in the Relab HS project, is to see how we can leverage technology and use telemedicine approaches to be able to equip community health workers, village health teams, physician support people, assessment checklists to identify people with uh, certain needs, some of which could actually be addressed within the community and they would not need to go um, to these uh, specialized health centers that are often in larger cities, um, but also provide a way for referral pathways and coordination of care to happen. So communication across different levels of the, the health system. Um, so yeah, we also found um, so one of the things um, with Leonard and I'm not sure with Ernest, but in our work, we actually the people that are changing that theology, the people that are the problem, if you will, with mis with superstitious beliefs, we end up when they change their belief system, which happens strangely in a one day workshop, they end up being those advocates in the community because what we found is it doesn't really matter how amazing of a hospital you have, how amazing healthcare, if children with disabilities are tied to trees or locked inside houses, which is often the case when they believe that uh, disabilities are coming from those uh, other causes. And what we found is that pastors, even tr and traditional healers as well, can actually be community activists around disability and become community health workers too. And so it's amazing. We have a lot of volunteers that are through those networks that are able to report back mm -hmm. to do referrals and so on, because it's, it's hard to do much for people with disabilities if you can't find them in the first place. And one of the things we've found is through our workshops, these pastors, traditional healers are actually finding people with disabilities so that they can and get the assistance that they need. Um, there's a question here um, from Doug. Um, is there a global roadmap or authoritative resource that the global church can use as a reference that addresses theological, practical, social, emotional, and other issues about disability inclusion? And he said, if not, should there be? But I do believe that there are. Would you, and in any three of you, uh, want to respond to what you feel is the best resource uh, regarding what Doug has asked? around these theological issues. There is the Luzon paper on disability, which is one. Ernest, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, I, I wanted to say that we seem to have contextualized resources like what Kupenda, Cure are doing, but most of the times from a global level, the Lausanne uh, movement, I think those kind of form 
the backbone of some of these materials. The only issue is sometimes you may need to contextualize based on your, your location. Yeah, and, and in the Lausanne paper, it talks about things like 90% of people with disabilities lack access to the church. Um, it's a little bit of an old paper, older paper now, but there are a lot of other resources that um, Carolyn just put into the chat um, that you can look into. Um, there's many, many resources out there that we'd love to provide on the CCIH website as well that talk about some of these. There's also another consortium called the Faith and Disability Consortium out of Beth Bethesda, Maryland, um, which is more academic and has a lot more research about this as well. Um, Leonard, did you want to add anything in terms of uh, to address some of these challenges? Come again, Cindy. Um, one of the questions was, is there a good global and authoritative resource that the global church can use as a reference that addresses theological practice, social, emotional, and other issues about disability inclusion? And I would say if there's not, of course there should be. Um, but I think that the question is what what do you, and, and there's uh, there's actually several organizations that have developed these, or, these um, tools. And what would you say is a good tool for people wanting to address the, these theological, practical, social, emotional issues about disability inclusion? If I'm not wrong, I have seen one and this is the Beyond Suffering. Mm -hmm. yeah. By Johnny and Friends, right? Yeah, I see that that uh, resource is very helpful for people who want to understand more about uh, uh, disability and uh, the church. So that's what I can recommend. Maybe there are other resources, but uh, I can't really remember. Yeah, and I think we only have one minute left. I, I just really appreciate everyone sharing today. Again, I wish we had more time to talk about all of this, uh, but we'd love to hear more from you. Um, in the link that Kathy just provided in the chat. And I also would love to, um, yeah, in any resources will be try to be sure that you have um, access to them. And again, if you're interested in reaching out to us, please do feel free to reach out to any one of the panel members to have further discussions about this really important issue. I'm glad that we at least got to start talking about this today. I feel like we've just kind of been hit the tip of, of, of the issue because it's so much deeper and wider and affects everything that we do because people with disabilities are everywhere. And if we're not including people with disabilities, you're meeting a lot, you're missing a large portion of the population and one of the more vulnerable groups that exist in the world. So thank you very much everyone for your time and I look forward 